the meantime, I have the privilege, the honor, of welcoming my friend and colleague, soon-to-be doctor, and <laughs> year graduate student at the University of Washington in the Earth and Space Sciences program, Joshua Christensen. Thank you. Sorry for joining me and welcoming Josh. So many of you saw the, the title of my talk tonight, something about old rocks and looking for alien life, and maybe you came here expecting to see this guy. Um, so, so I'm very sorry to disappoint you. My hair is not that spectacular. Uh, and we'll be talking science tonight. Also, as much as I think the, uh, the title of the Bowie song is asking a really interesting question, whether there's life on Mars or elsewhere in the solar system, for the purposes of tonight's talk, uh, I'm going to be focused on looking for life on planets around other stars, on, on exoplanets. So as I'm sure you're all well aware, you know, literally thousands of exoplanets have been discovered in recent years, uh, and so we basically know that every, every star has a planet, statistically speaking. And so here are you know, some lovely exoplanets. Of course, these aren't real, these are artist renditions. You don't get pictures like that because they're far away. And because the techniques we use to detect these planets rely on indirect methods, right? You don't see the planet directly, you see the effect it has on its star, the transit. So, because the, the techniques are indirect, we don't, for any given exoplanet, we don't actually get a lot of information, right? And so for many of these, these planets, you can basically write everything we know about them on the back of a postcard. And so I've done that for a particular exoplanet, right? This is everything we know about TRAPPIST-1e, more or less. I, I chose TRAPPIST-1e because it is literally named after Peter, and so that seemed appropriate. Um, but, but this is what we know, right? We, we know its mass, roughly. We know some things about its orbit, how much light it receives from its host star. We know its radius, so you, you can combine the mass and radius to get some crude estimate of its, uh, its density, right? Its overall composition, whether it's rocky, icy, or gas. But that's about it. We, we know its atmosphere is probably not hydrogen, but, but that's all. Uh, and so, it's with these indirect techniques, it's difficult to say much. If you want to memorize everything on this postcard, you know as much as anyone knows about this planet. But this will change soon, right? So. You know, despite the frustrating delays, James, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch sometime in the next few years, and you can see it, right? It's basically a complete instrument. They've got to fix some things up, then it'll go. Uh, and then a little further in the future, there are three very large ground-based telescopes uh, that'll begin observations in the, in the 2020s. They're all under construction. And then looking a little further ahead, the selection process for NASA's next flagship mission has just begun. And, and three of the four possible uh, designs for that mission would all be capable of doing a lot of detailed exoplanet observations. And so we can expect, uh, I should say that, so, so all the telescopes I just mentioned, um, they will all be, be capable of looking at rocky exoplanets in more detail. And so how do you do that? Uh, basically, you, you take the light from the a planet, and with a bit of help from Pink Floyd, you split it into its component wavelengths, right? And so if you look at the amount of light, you get a different wavelength. You can look for the, the diagnostic absorption features of particular gases in that, planet, in that planet's atmosphere, right? You get the atmospheric composition. And so you can look for the gases that might be produced by life. So what we can expect in the not-too-distant future is a slightly more detailed postcard. Right, this is what we might expect from, from trappist one e with some James Webb observations. In addition to the, the mass, the radius, the orbital stuff we already know, we will start to get information about atmospheric composition. Right? What, are the, what are the gases in this planet's atmosphere? Are there gases produced by, by life? And so when we get to this point, so let's just assume for a minute that all that goes to plan. Right? The telescopes work as advertised, you get this information back you're then left with a very difficult question of interpretation, right? Does this planet have life or not, based just on the atmospheric composition? And so this is no longer just a question of astronomy, right? This is a question that uh, 
It's relevant to, to geology, atmospheric chemistry, uh, geochemistry, and indeed biology. Uh, and by the way, that's sort of what astrobiology is, right? It's an attempt to bring together these people from different areas, get them talking to try and answer these difficult interdisciplinary questions. So, we can expect uh, information like this and expect to have to answer this difficult interpretive question. And we want to get it right, right? We don't want to make these observations and then say, announce to the world, we have found life on an exoplanet. I need to realize a couple years later, oh, actually, it was just a weird volcano and something weird, right? But we also want to avoid the opposite, where we overlook something that looks you know, not like the life we're expecting and miss that, that really profound discovery. So my next slide kind of tries to capture the, the complexity of this uh, question of interpretation, right? So, <laughs> so, so we get a limited information on a planet, and how do we decide if it's a living world, right? Something that requires life to explain what you see in the atmosphere, or something dead, something that can be explained by purely you know, geological, geochemical processes, and is basically a, a lifeless and, and boring place. Uh, moving on. <laughs> anyway, so, so with all that, um, with all of that as introduction, um, the, the knowledge that we uh, are soon going to face this difficult question. What I'd really like to convince you of today is that by learning about the early Earth, learning about the early Earth can help answer, help us answer that question, help us interpret those observations, right? Now, just to be clear on what I mean, when I say the early Earth, that probably conjures up images in your mind, something like this, right? Like dinosaurs wandering around a tropical forest, eating each other, having a good time. Uh, but this, for all intents and purposes, is the modern Earth, right? So you look at the, the timeline of Earth history, from Earth formation, four and a half billion years ago to, to the present. Every plant or animal you've ever heard of has only existed for this time here, right? And so you have the rest of this very vast history, uh, which is more typical of Earth's state, right? Uh, and, and by learning about that very alien place, I think this can help guide our, our search for life elsewhere. Right, so, so geologists, paleobiologists have worked uh, very hard to kind of reconstruct the history of Earth as best as possible from the rock record. And so both uh, myself and, and Mike, who's talking later tonight, are going to just give you a few examples of, of things on this, this figure and why they might be important. To motivate that more specifically though, well, okay, so how do you detect life on an exoplanet, right? You look for the gases that are produced by, by life. And the most obvious candidate for that, as I'm sure you probably guess, is oxygen, right? Oxygen is a pretty good biosignature gas. It's produced by photosynthesis, either plants or cyanobacteria. And uh, it's virtually all the oxygen in the air we breathe is produced by life. And if life would disappear from the surface of the Earth, the oxygen wouldn't hang around, right? It would very quickly react with surface rocks, react with things coming out of volcanoes, and, and be gone. And so the persistence of oxygen in a rocky planet's atmosphere is a pretty good biosignature. Now, we have been able to, to reconstruct the, the history of atmospheric oxygen on Earth, right? And I think this gives us some reason to be cautious about you know, going out there and expecting to easily find oxygen as a sign of life on the planet. So, so this is the story of oxygen on Earth, right? We're just plotting the amount of oxygen in the air from four billion years ago to the present. And you can see that oxygen levels have only really been high at sort of modern, near modern levels for the last half a billion years, right? And so how we know this is, is kind of a complicated story, and uh, Mike's going to talk a bit more about that, but you know, there are some, basically it's from the rock record, right? So if you look at uh, more, more modern rocks, you see fossilized evidence of wildfires, right? And so you, you can't combust things that are organic matter with oxygen if there isn't a decent amount of oxygen around. So that kind of gives you a, a flaw on oxygen here. Yeah. Uh, but then at earlier times, there's very good evidence that oxygen was significantly lower or virtually absent from Earth's atmosphere, right? This is a log scale 
let me heal. Uh, and I don't really have time to, to dive into how we know that. It's a really fascinating story. Um, rocks, these really old rocks, you can look at the, uh, the sulfur in them and, and how that sulfur is being uh, modified by atmospheric reactions. It's a very clear signature of an oxygen-free atmosphere. But anyway, this is, the, this is the picture of Earth's oxygen through time. And this is potentially a problem, right? Because if you're looking for oxygen elsewhere, as a sign of life. For starters, there's no guarantees that oxygen making photosynthesis is a common thing. Like, even if life is common, right? There's no guarantee that that particular metabolism is common. It seems to have only evolved once here on Earth. It's a very complicated metabolism. Uh, but even if it is common, that's still no guarantee that oxygen biosignatures are common, right? We know that life on Earth has been around pretty much this whole time. Oxygen making photosynthesis has been around most of this time. It just took a long time for oxygen to accumulate at modern levels. So there's no guarantee that modern Earth-like levels of oxygen are going to be uh, easy to find out there. So what we'd really like to be able to do is to take life on, on these sorts of planets, right? These early Earth kind of planets that are more typical of Earth's history. So how might we do that? Um, well, as a starting point, you want to reconstruct what the early Earth was like as best you can create a picture of that. And uh, at least as far as the atmosphere goes, you have a reasonable idea. You think that at those very early times when the atmosphere was oxygen-free, this is kind of what was going on in Earth's atmosphere. Uh, still a lot of nitrogen around, a lot of CO2, a lot more than there is now, a lot of methane. How do we know that? Again, it's from the rock record, right? So you can do neat things where you look at the size distribution of fossilized raindrops, and you can do the physics and back out something about atmospheric pressures. It tells you there had to have been some nitrogen around. Um, I already mentioned there's evidence for very low oxygen. How do we know CO2 was really high back then? There are multiple lines of evidence. Perhaps the most intuitive one is just the fact that the sun was a lot dimmer back then, but the Earth wasn't totally frozen over. You know that from the rock record, and so there had to have been a much stronger greenhouse effect. There had to have been much higher CO2. And there's also interesting uh, recent evidence from, from the rock record that methane levels are quite high. So this is the picture we have of Earth's early atmosphere. Uh, and we know something else about this. If you put this combination of gases together, the methane doesn't hang around. You wait a few tens of thousands of years, blink of an eye, really, ge geologically speaking, then the methane gets broken up by UV radiation, the hydrogen is lost, and the methane is gone. So to sustain such an atmosphere on the early Earth, there really needed to be a very large uh, flux of methane into the atmosphere from the surface, replenishing the methane continuously. Right? And we're pretty sure that this flux was provided by, by life, by biology. Not this, not this kind of life, right? No oxygen around, but, but microbes. Uh, microbes, microbial production of methane is a very common, uh, common metabolism. So what this shows is that the atmosphere of the early Earth was this, it was very clearly biological, right? There was bright neon signs, life is here, life has been obvious on Earth to an external observer for billions of years. And this raises the, the other, the, I guess the, the next question. Is that, okay, this is what was happening on the early Earth, right? Suppose you see this on an exoplanet, right? Now, you've just got the postcard, remember, you don't know anything about the surface anymore, you just get the atmospheric composition. But just from the atmospheric composition and the knowledge that there must be methane replenishment, can you then infer that this planet has life. And so this has kind of been a subject of some of my research and thinking about, well, okay, say we see this on an exoplanet, can you explain it by some other process? And so you can kind of work through what, what is geochemically plausible and think about these different scenarios of methane coming out of volcanoes or from reactions with rock and, and think about not only are they likely, but if they did happen, what other clues would they leave? What, what are the other observations you can make that would distinguish these things? And without you know, diving into the details, the tentative conclusion is, yeah, you could probably rule these things out. 
And so if you could see such an atmosphere and make these observations, you could make a reasonable inference to, uh, to life. This is just a, a fun little aside. Um, so when we published this paper, various news organizations deemed it sufficiently clickbait worthy to do a little thing on it. And it was kind of fun to see it filter through. So you know, have like reputable organizations like Scientific American, LA Times basically got it right, and basically said, yeah, here's some new ideas about how you might look for life on a planet without oxygen in its atmosphere. But you know, it filtered down, and some of the headlines were quite amusing. This is my favorite. Revealed the huge scientific breakthrough that proves alien life on other planets. <laughs> like, hmm, I don't remember saying that. Uh, so that was interesting for me, just to see how science gets manipulated. Um, I also like that Fox News categorized it under UFOs. That I'm using. <laughs> um, just briefly to link things back to how I start, where I started, and saying that this is something that's detectable soon. This is some other work I've done, which is kind of more standard astronomy. Um, this is just saying, remember our postcard planet, TRAPPIST-1E? In this, in this paper, we, we said, let's pretend that TRAPPIST-1E is like the early Earth, right? With this methane and CO2 in its atmosphere. Could you detect that? Was James Webb. And, and the answer seems to be yes, right? This is just the amount of light in different wavelengths. This is the Pink Floyd thing again. Uh, and yeah, with, with 10 orbits, you can, you can potentially see it. Uh, and detecting this early Earth biosignature might actually be easier than detecting an oxygen biosignature, at least uh, with James Webb. So, so that's kind of what I had. I guess to, to summarize that then, looking for the, the modern Earth as an exoplanet is sort of the obvious thing to do, right? Of course, we should go out there and look for oxygen-rich biospheres, oxygen-rich atmospheres as a biosignature. But by thinking about the early Earth and thinking about how uh, the, the biosphere changed the atmosphere in this oxygen-free world, um, it presents another possibility, another way of looking for life. And I haven't really dived into this, but one could make the argument that these sorts of biospheres are maybe more common than these sorts, right? Not only from the story of Earth history, but also just from the fact that oxygen production is a very complicated metabolism, methane production, relatively simple, seems to have emerged almost immediately after the origin of life um, and, and has emerged multiple times independently. So potentially this is more, more ubiquitous. And in general, this is just one example of how we learn about the early Earth can inform the search for life elsewhere. So yeah, telescopes coming soon, but again, look at the atmospheric composition of rocky planets. That's pretty exciting, uh, but how are we gonna know if we've found life or not? Uh, so I've tried to convince you that, that Earth's history uh, in, deep, in deep time can help us with that question, by, provide examples of alternative biosignatures. So, so that's all I'll have. I'll be very happy to, to answer questions. I do stick around for Mike's talk. He's gonna talk more about the story of oxygen and how it relates to the life we really care about complex life, like, like you mind. So, yeah, with that, thank you very much. Yeah. So the question was, what is serpentinization? It's something that I flashed up on an earlier slide. So this is a, a process that might produce methane without life, right? So, so water reacts with rock, and the sea floor this releases hydrogen gas, and that hydrogen gas can then react with CO2 that's just hanging around and produce methane. So um, potentially you can make a, a lot of methane this way. Uh, we've done some calculations to show it's still considerably less than one million uh, from life. <laughs> So the question was whether uh, these exoplanets are certainly going to have some kind of atmosphere or not. We, we really don't know at this point. Um, it could be the case that some of these planets are just blasted by such intense radiation when they start that they just lifeless rocks like the like moon. Right? So even for the, the relatively easy ones to observe, like the Trappist planets, we still don't know if they have an atmosphere or not.
together, which is a sign of life rather than methane alone. And the reason for that is that methane and CO2 uh, is covered opposite ends of the redox spectrum, like its most oxidized form and its least oxidized form. You can produce either end with non-biological processes, but to produce those two extremes without life, that's really hard. You're going to see that in the rest. So, so the question was asked, how on earth do you get learn anything about the atmosphere from the shape of raindrops? Um, so it's the size distribution, I forget the details of the physics, but basically the size of the raindrop imprints tell you some, something about the maximum velocity of the raindrops acquire, as they fall. It's that velocity is related to the density of the atmosphere. So, um, The question was asked, how does looking for water like for that is? Um, so that's kind of the earliest step in the way. We want to verify that the planet can be habitable to begin with, right, before you start looking for possible signs of it. So whether it's, it's possible for it to have liquid water on the surface. So that's something that we want to verify eventually with these sorts of planets to make sure that it is in fact habitable. Um, so how, how you might do that, there are all sorts of techniques I suggest that you can take some surface water and take more time and it's going to be so it's the same process here, so we'll focus on the architecture. Okay, one more question. Yeah. Uh, the question was asked why the sun was doing um, And that just comes from the physics of fusion and the core as you burn hydrogen to heal it or uh, reducing the amount of dead CO2 and particles. So the temperature goes up and you're still not more light because you fuse more hydrogen to it. So that physics is pretty well understood. All right. Uh, I'll be around if you want to come and chat. Thanks very much. Keep it going for Josh. Who's ready for some trivia answers? Moons are hard, but you guys are awesome. Makabaka is not the second known coverable object of the moon. There's Eris, there's Pluto, there's Sephiroth.